All right, we'll get started, I think. Um, it is exciting to see everybody both online and here in the room. Um, we're going to have a great talk today. Super excited for Dr. Katie Wilkinson uh, to speak about her work. A um, couple of things to go through before we get started, though, so let me um, move into those. The first is, and most importantly, I think, is we want to always acknowledge the land on which this work happens. So we would like to begin this event by recognizing that while we gather at San Jose State University, we are gathered on the ethno-historical tribal territory of the Tamian Ohlone, who were the direct ancestors of the lineages enrolled in the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and who were missionized into Mission Santa Clara, San Jose, and Dolores. The lands on which San Jose State University is established was and continues to be of significance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. We also recognize that the ancestors of the Muwekma Ohlone constructed and maintained the three Bay Area missions. Our campus extends to the surrounding areas that held a Tupantak, a traditional roundhouse, which were located, which were once located on the historic Lope Ingo's land grant, Rancho Posomi y Positas de la Animas, or the Little Well of Souls, and also Marcelo Pio and Cristobal's land grant, Rancho Ulistac which were places of celebration and religious ceremonies, as well as nearby ancestral heritage shell mounds that served as the tribe's traditional cemetery sites and territorial monuments. San Jose State University also desires to honor the military service of the Muek Ohlone, the men and women who have honorably served overseas during World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm Iraq, and who are still serving in the United States Armed Forces today. So with that, I want to make a couple of quick announcements before I get into the formal introduction of our speaker. Um, live captioning is enabled, and the webinar is being recorded, and we post all the webinars after they're done, so they live forever. So nail it, okay, Katie? Uh, it, in all seriousness, no, it's nice to be able to have a record of the amazing contributions of our colleagues. If you have questions and you're online, there's a Q&A function. Obviously, for the traditionalists in the room, this is called your hand and you raise it, you do the same thing online and we'll use that throughout um, the question and answer period. So feel free to post questions as you go and, and uh, the speaker will get to them afterwards. Also have to thank the Office of the Provost, the King Library, the Department of Biological Sciences and the D Division of Research and Innovation for their support of this series. So with that, let me uh, begin by um, introducing Dr. Katie Wilkinson, who is a professor of biological sciences here at San Jose State University. She worked her way up the ranks here from assistant to associate to full professor. She's done some incredible work having visiting fellowships um, in Munich, having been a member of uh, the San Jose State Op-Ed Project, having published numerous public pieces, not just on her own work, um, but on her thoughts about higher education, about women in STEM, about the tech industry. She's earned numerous awards and has published her research in so many journals that I cannot even begin to outline them, but included amongst those is Science, one of the premier journals uh, for science uh, folks. She has National Science Foundation as well as NIH grant research to do both her basic uh, research, and I mean basic in the most complicated way, in the lab, as well as the National Science Foundation work to think about the ways in which we educate students in the sciences. Katie embodies what I think a San Jose State faculty member should, someone who truly considers themselves a teacher scholar who works across the space of her science and back into the classroom again. We are very fortunate to have Katie here and is just so excited to have her speak today on the muscle spindle, the most important sensory organ you've never heard of. Katie. Well, thank you, Vin, for that wonderful introduction. I'll try to live up to it. Um, so thank you to all the organizers for putting this on. Um, great, thank you. Um, thank you to all of you who are spending part of your day either here in person or online. 
hopefully by the end of my talk, uh, I will convince you that the muscle spindle is very important, or at the very least, you will know what it is, and then I will have done my job. I like to start all of my talks by acknowledging the people who actually do the work, uh, and that's the students in my lab. I don't get the chance or the time to tell you about all of the stuff that we've done in the lab, but over my 11 and a half years here, I've had the pleasure of mentoring 94 undergraduate and master's students uh, and still recruiting any of the students online. Um, and as you can see, they're not only great scientists, but they're also super fun people. And the Wilkinson Lab has been known to win a costume contest or two. All right, so like I said, I'm gonna be talking to you today about sensory physiology. And when you were little, one of the first things that you learned was that you have five senses, sight, hearing, uh, taste, smell, and touch. And those senses are very important. It helps you see what's going, or helps you experience what's going on in the world around you. But you have more than five senses. And today I'm going to tell you about what's commonly known as the sixth sense. And no, I'm not talking about seeing dead people, which you all are of the right age group to actually get that joke, unlike my students. So thank you for that opportunity. Uh, but proprioception. And proprioception is a big word that just means your sense of body and limb position in space. Proprioception is what allows you uh, to walk around, shoot a basketball, or in very extreme cases like shown here, uh, walk on a tightrope while blindfolded. Unlike sight or hearing or smell, uh, you can't turn on and off proprioception, and this is a very good thing. But it also means it flies under the radar for even understanding how important it is or what it actually does. And so as with many things in biology, we can learn a lot about cases where you take away something, either an extreme environment where you can't have that sense or a disease state. And in the case of proprioception, there is a very rare disorder. It's a viral infection and it targets the neurons that are the most important for proprioception. Luckily, only about 10 cases of this occur in the world, um, but we've learned a lot from them. And especially from one particular person, um, his name's Ian Waterman, who's shown here. When he was struck by this disease, he was in his 20s, a butcher in England, a pretty fit and active guy. But when he woke up one day, he was effectively paralyzed after this infection. His muscles and motor neurons were perfectly fine, but the infection had killed all of his sensory neurons. And while he still had the ability to contract his muscle, he didn't have this constant sense of where his body was in space. And so he would try to sit up and he just couldn't coordinate it to do it. Uh, even more, I guess, scarily, uh, if he woke up and his arm had gone over his face in the night, he would scream and think that someone was attacking him because he had no sense that that was his arm or his body. So um, hopefully, uh, that convinced you it's important. Uh, luckily in Ian's case, he was a very stubborn uh, and motivated person. And so after years of physical therapy, he actually taught himself how to walk and move again. But if you look at some videos of him walking, um, which this BBC documentary, The Man Who Lost His Body is wonderful, if you have the time, um, you'll notice that he has a very weird gait. Maybe I should switch to this one so you can still hear me. He has to look where his um, muscles are at all times. And he has to think, I'm going to contract this muscle, relax that muscle. And he can only do it when, um, when he has vision, when he's looking, when he's thinking about it. So not only is this um, incredibly challenging, it means he can't walk in the dark. Back. Uh, he can't walk in the dark. He can't walk on an airplane, which maybe you don't notice it, right? But the airplane's moving. You actually have to correct your balance a lot to, to get down the aisle. So he can't do any walking um, when it's challenged and he can't use his vision. And he also compares the amount of cognitive effort that it takes for him to walk around um, to the equivalent of running a marathon every single day, right? So this He's having to use his brain power, his conscious brain power to think about every motor movement, which in you and I, when we have normal proprioception, you don't even think about it. 
Um, and if you're interested more in Ian's story and in the stuff that um, scientists can learn about proprioception from Ian and those like him, there are also two, uh, two wonderful books written by a neurologist that worked with Ian over the years, uh, Jonathan Cole, Pride in the Daily Marathon, and Losing Touch. Right, so hopefully I've convinced you proprioception is important, right? And your sense of proprioception integrates a lot of sensory information, vision, uh, vestibular system, some touch, but the major proprioceptors are located in your muscles. And there are two types, one that senses forces that I won't talk about today, and another that senses muscle stretch, the muscle spindle afferents or the muscle spindle proprioceptors. And I have a cartoon drawing here for you um, to highlight where they are. So these are located in your muscle. Um, when we think about muscle, we normally think about these kind of pinkish rectangles that I have here. These are your extrafusal contractile uh, muscle fibers. They're the things that move you around. Embedded inside these extrafusal fibers are these encapsulated structures called the muscle spindle. And you can tell a lot about what your body cares about uh, by figuring out how much energy it puts into maintaining something or uh, building it. And your body cares a whole lot about um, proprioceptive information because its muscle spindles are, are A, very numerous, they're in all of your muscles, um, and B, they have a very unique structure. They have their own specialized muscle fibers called intrafusal fibers. They're innervated by stretch sensitive um, sensory neurons, which I'll spend most of the day, time talking about now, but they also have their own motor system. 30% of the motor neurons in your body innervate these muscle spindles. They're called gamma motor neurons, and they tune the length of the muscle spindle. They don't contribute at all to force generation, um, but they can tell you to pay more attention to your proprioceptive information or not. So you spend a lot of energy getting this stretch sensitive information, and by knowing how long your muscles are and if they're moving, you can know where your arms are uh, even when you have your eyes closed. And so up there, I've got my cartoon drawing of the muscle spindle, but it really does kind of look like that um, in the body. I also like to show this one because this is my SJSU muscle spindle. <laughs> um, this is from a mouse and I've stained the neurons with, the yellow, with yellow there. And you can see the neurons innervate the muscle or they wrap around the muscle and they kind of look like a slinky. So uh, you envision me holding a slinky right now. If I stretch the muscle, that slinky is going to be pulled apart. The blue dots are nuclei. And so that just shows you where the muscle fibers are. So you can see that slinky neuron innervates around. And then you can see the cells on the edge of the capsule. So it's this um, encapsulated structure. And its job is to report muscle length to you. In addition to proprioception and providing the most important sensory input for proprioception, the muscle spindle is also involved in motor reflexes and especially the muscle stretch reflex. We've all been to the doctor and had our tendon tap reflex tested, right? What's happening there is when the doctor hits your tendon, they stretch out your muscle very quickly. And this quick stretch increases activity in the neurons in the muscle spindle. And unlike most reflexes in your body, which have to go through some intermediaries and some processing, um, this reflex is so important, it just goes straight to one neuron to cause reflex contraction. Right, so that's why your leg kicks up because you've contracted that muscle. And the reason you wanna do this at heart is that it's protective, right? If someone came and yanked down on your arm, if you didn't um, oppose that, they could tear your muscles. So you don't want that to happen. But this reflex and others that use similar stretch or force information also help you correct ongoing behavior as you're walking. Now here in the library, we've got a nice smooth surface for me to walk, so hopefully I shouldn't trip. Right? But if I'm out in an un, um, a not smooth environment and I suddenly step lower than I think, I've stepped into a hole, my body can recognize that the muscle is not where it thinks it should be. It's stretched out more than it, um, it wants to be. And you could start uh, stretch reflexes and other stabilizing reflexes to help you maintain balance. So not only are you generating this picture of where you are in space with the muscle spindle information, you're also using it in these motor reflexes to smooth your behavior as you go. So without this sensory input, you don't have, um, you don't have efficient motor behavior if you have it at all. 
And so, like I said, hopefully I've convinced you this is an important system to study, right? So my lab studies two main types of questions. Um, the first is a basic science question. We wanna know what are the molecular components that are necessary for stretch sensitivity in the muscle spindle, right? So how does it work? How do we put together all the proteins and other things um, to give us this important sensory information? And related to that, um, we, we wanna understand what makes the muscle spindle stop working as well. And then hopefully how can we fix it if it's impaired? So there are many different um, conditions and diseases where you alter muscle spindle activity. Um, things like uh, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease uh, has altered muscle spindle function, a lot of neuromuscular diseases and some genetic diseases that I'll, I will talk to you about. Um, as we age, our muscle spindle system gets less uh, less accurate. Um, and my lab has a bit of evidence that this also happens during obesity as well. So I won't be able to talk to you about all of the different projects that we've worked on in my lab, um, but I'm going to highlight one that started as really a basic science question of understanding what are the molecular components? What do you need to make the muscle spindle work? And then has morphed into looking um, to disease states that affect um, the protein that we identified. In my lab, we use a mouse model to answer our questions. So I wanted to take a few minutes to uh, tell you why we do that and also hopefully dispel some myths about animal research in general. So we use mice in my lab because they're a very good model system for what we wanna do. A lot of functions and behaviors and proteins are very conserved in mice and humans, we're both mammals. Of course, we're not exactly the same, but you can learn a lot from studying things first in mice and then seeing if it can translate into humans. The mouse also has a wonderful genetic toolkit. Um, we can go in and take out genes so that um, the mouse can't make a certain protein. We can mutate those genes uh, to alter the function and then study what happens in our model system. So I really like this statue here. It's a monument to the laboratory mouse in Russia. It expresses both the unique um, uh, good things that mice can allow you to do, but also the respect that animal researchers have for their subjects, because we're not able to do uh, our research without the sacrifice of these animals. And I also wanna talk a little bit about uh, the mechanisms that do allow us to use uh, mice. So every single animal study that you want to do has to be approved by a committee, an ethics and regulatory committee, the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. And so as a researcher, what I do is I explain why what I wanna do is important and non-duplicative, why what we will get out of the science is worth the sacrifice of the animals. I explain how um, I've reduced the number of animals used to the least amount possible, how I've refined my procedures to reduce the levels of pain and distress for the animals themselves, and that I'm sure that there's not a lower animal or non-animal model that can answer the same question. So all of the studies that I'm showing you today have been through that process. And speaking for myself and all my colleagues who are animal researchers, we take this responsibility very seriously. So what do we actually do in the lab? So we use an isolated system to understand and listen in on how these stretch sensitive neurons are responding. And so we use a mouse or a mouse a muscle nerve preparation where we take out a calf muscle and the nerve that innervates it from our mouse and put it in a tissue bath where we can mimic the environment um, of the muscle in the body. We hook it up to a uh, length controller that can precisely change the length of the muscle in a very reproducible fashion um, so that we can compare from animal to animal. And then we can listen in on the neurons that we study using a section electrode and an amplifier, which I'm going to explain in a bit more detail. Okay, so I have to give you a little bit of Neuroscience 101 uh, to make sure that you understand uh, what I'm gonna be showing you. And the job of neurons is to talk to each other. And the code that neurons use is an electrical code um, that we call an action potential, which is just a depolarization or a movement of ions. So our neuron sends the action potentials down uh, at the end of the neuron. It can release chemical neurotransmitters, things like glutamate, serotonin, dopamine that you've probably heard of. 
that can act on receptors on its target cell and then keep, um, keep the signal going. And to generate this action potential, this is just movement of ions. So you spend a lot of energy uh, setting up ion gradients so that you've got a lot of sodium outside, little bit inside, and it's more positive outside than inside. So if I open channels, um, it allows ions to come in and depolarize the membrane, right? Um, what you just need to remember from this is this is basically electricity, ion movements, but they need to come in through channels. And our action potential code is all or none, either it's firing or it's not, but you can also encode information in how fast these neurons are firing. And so what I'm gonna show you is that the faster the muscle spindle afferents or the muscle proprioceptors are firing, the longer the muscle is. So this is what my students get. Um, you know, they've hooked up their electrode to the nerve uh, and onto the computer. Um, we can record the firing of the neuron. So just these little lines here, that's one action potential. On the bottom is the length of the muscle. So we hold it at an optimal length. We stretch it to longer, hold it there, and then relax it back down. And what you'll notice is that when the muscle is stretched, the firing rate of these neurons goes way up. And we can quantify this as instantaneous frequency. So when it's held at rest, it's you know firing at, let's say, 10 times per second. As you increase stretch, you get a big increase in firing. This gives you a little bit of information that your muscle's moving. It slowly adapts down to a plateau phase, um, and then you can relax it back to its, um, its resting length. So this code and these firing rates we can measure and then compare between different animal groups or under different conditions. And um, one of the important characteristics of these neurons is that there's a linear increase in firing rate as you stretch the muscle. So on the x-axis here is the stretch length of the muscle getting longer. On the y-axis is the firing rate of the neurons. And you can see as I lengthen the muscle, the firing rate goes up. And because this is linear over the physiological range, that means, right, I've only recorded at three different points here, but I have a pretty good sense if we're at, you know, the six here of what the firing rate of the neuron would be. And that is what your brain is using to figure out how long your muscles are, okay? So we can, re okay, sorry about that. Um, we can record, um, these firing rates in different conditions and compare them. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you a few examples of this. So the first study that um, I'm going to talk to you about today is, like I said, a very basic science question. Um, so these proprioceptors, they respond to stretch, right? So they have to have some way of coupling mechanical movement with their action potentials, right? To say, hey, the muscle's moving, we should fire our action potential. So what they need is an ion channel that will open to mechanical deformation or movement, allow those ions in, and then start the process of action potentials. So even though muscle proprioceptors were actually the first sensory neuron ever recorded electrophysiologically back in like the 1914s, I think, um, as of 2015, no one knew what the mechanically sensitive ion channel in these neurons was. They had some ideas, but um, uh, no one was sure. And so uh, we were contacted uh, by Dr. Ardem Pataputian and his lab at Scripps because they had discovered these mechanically sensitive ion channels called the piezos. He found that piezo two was found in um, the neurons that we study. And importantly, it led to proprioceptive deficits in the mice. These mice did not walk normally. So I am going to show you a little video of what happens if you take out, right, using our transgenic tools, if you take out this mechanically sensitive ion channel, but only in the hind limb sensory neurons of the mouse. So the forelimbs are gonna be working quite normally, but the hind limbs are not. And so what you'll see is it doesn't really appear that the mouse knows where its legs are, right? Occasionally it'll get kind of into a good, good movement with the back legs, it almost looks normal, right? Because again, muscles, and uh, motor neurons are just fine. It's just the sensory neurons. And if you compare it again with the forelimbs, which are completely normal, you see that there seems to be a complete lack of awareness in this mouse where its legs are. 
So they wondered if piezo-2 was actually this long sought mechanically sensitive ion channel in the muscle proprioceptors. And so they sent us the mice and asked us uh, to look in our system to see if in fact uh, you lose all stretch sensitivity if you don't have this channel, right? If this piezo-2 channel is essential for stretch sensitivity in the muscle proprioceptors, if I stretch the muscle, I shouldn't really be able to capture anything stretch sensitive. And so what we did is we compared stretch responses in wild type mice that had our channel piezo-2 uh, in black here with mice that did not have piezo-2. And what I hope you can appreciate uh, is that with the channel, you get this normal stretch sensitivity, nine of the 10 muscles that we looked at, 10th one was probably experimental error. In our piezo-2 knockout animals, we saw almost nothing stretch sensitive. In one of the eight muscles, we saw something, but this was weird, wasn't even normal. Um, and most of them, we just saw nothing. So this was pretty good evidence that you needed piezo-2 to get stretch sensitivity in the muscle proprioceptors, and that it could be this long lost mechanically sensitive ion channel. I'd like to acknowledge two SJSU undergraduates, Dasha Zaitseva, Dasha Zaitseva and Connor Cradell, who did these experiments. Um, as undergrads in the lab. Although I like to joke, these are actually the easiest experiments we've ever done in my entire career uh, because just looking at it, right, don't even need to do stats. Um, so it will also probably be the most cited paper that I ever work on. What can you do? Um, so, you know, we were pretty sure that piezo-2 was essential in mice. I tried to convince you that mice are really good models. Um, but you never know what is actually conserved up to humans. So the year after we published our paper, uh, two independent groups found um, families and patients uh, that had proprioceptive deficits. And when they did the um, sequencing of the mutations, found that these mutations were in piezo-2 and made piezo-2 non-functional. So essentially like our piezo-2 knockout animals. And so I showed you, um, I showed you the video of the mouse without piezo-2 walking around. Now I'm gonna show you a video of a human walking around without piezo-2. I'm only gonna show you a bit of this. In your nose with your eyes closed. Proprioception is what allows you to do this since it's telling you the relative positions of your nose and finger. However, not everyone is able to do this. My colleagues and I have been studying people with an extremely rare disorder that causes them to lose their sense of where their body parts are in space, as well as their sense of touch. And so people with this disorder can't feel things that brush their skin, and they have to look at their feet while walking in order to keep their balance. Recently in the lab... So... Um, as you can see, that patient there, right, without visual feedback, was not able to walk around normally either because she also didn't have piezo-2 and then the sensory feedback that comes from it. So we were pretty excited to see that what we found in mice uh, did, in fact, translate into humans. And so um, piezo-2 um, is an area of very active research for a lot of things, not just there are a lot of genetic disorders that affect it. And I'll talk to you about another one in just a bit. Um, but it's also found in a lot of tissue types. And so anyone that can figure out drugs that can inhibit it or target it in other ways will be quite rich, I think. And in fact, um, not only I thought that this you know, research was cool, in 2021, the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine was awarded to two scientists whose labs found um, ion channel subtypes that sensed uh, temperature and heat pain in David Julius's lab, and then our collaborator, Dr. Ardem Padaputian, for the discovery of the piezo channels, and especially for their function in touch and proprioception. And uh, really the, the reason that he was uh, given the Nobel Prize again, was showing that these piezo-2 and piezo-1 channels, um, when there was mechanical force, they would open, allow ions in, and then couple that mechanical movement with action potentials. They've since found, um, again, like I showed you, it's involved in proprioception, touch, also other things like um, knowing when your bladder is full and blood pressure. And I have to brag a little bit because the Nobel Committee 
highlights four key publications for the reason for giving out the Nobel Prize. And one of those publications was the one that we had worked on uh, showing that piezo-2 was important for proprioception. So two SJSU undergrads are on the Nobel Prize website, which is pretty darn cool and a lot closer to that prize that I ever thought anything that I ever worked on would be. So go SJSU and proprioception. Uh, in addition to mutations that um, cause piezo-2 to be completely non-functional, there are other genetic diseases which alter piezo-2 function in the reverse way. So there's a group of, uh, or there's, there's a syndrome called distal arthrogryposis type 5, which I'm just going to call DA type 5 from now on, um, which in some of the patients, it's caused by an overactive piezo-2 channel. So you um, piezo-2 uh, tends to stay open for longer and take longer to close. And what's interesting is that these patients have some similar uh, symptoms as to those who completely lack piezo-2. And that includes proprioceptive deficits. Um, they have very, uh, very characteristic things called joint contractures. So um, they kind of hold their muscles in weird ways. Um, and they also have weak tendon reflexes that progress over time. And so uh, our DEMS lab made a mouse model of this disease with this mutation and asked us um, again to collaborate. And so what they found in their lab um, in this mouse model, again, like I said, the mice have proprioceptive deficits. They also have joint contractures. Uh, this is a very cool paper. I don't have time to go into the whole thing, but they found there was a developmental time point that this overactive piezo-2 channel needed to be expressed. And that actually you could reverse the symptoms if you gave the mice early enough Botox or fed them a diet high in fish oil, um, which is again, now it remains to be seen if that can be translated into human patients. Um, we came involved in trying to figure out the mechanism. So why does this overactive piezo-2 channel uh, cause um, these proprioceptive disorders. So again, we, we took the mice and compared their function. And so these and uh, a few other portions that I don't have time to talk about today uh, were done by four SJSU undergrads, Alexandra Salazar, Sarah Chu, Nicola Clyer, and Samir Masri. And uh, what I'm showing you here are actually stretch sensitive traces from seven day old mice. This was actually incredibly technically challenging and Alex and Sarah uh, managed to, to get this to work. But what we found was a little non-exciting to us. We would have expected if this channel is overactive, we should have seen a lot more firing in our red neurons here. And we saw the exact same. Um, so there's, there's an example of science not, not going how you think. And some other experiments um, led us to believe that actually it's not activity in these neurons that cause um, some of the dysfunction. And what does is still up in the air and uh, hopefully someone will figure that out. What we also did that will hopefully set us up in the future though, is we looked then later on in development when these animals were adults and found that actually they had lower stretch sensitivity. Again, the opposite of what we would think, but it matches what you see in patients where over time they lose their tendon reflexes. So um, what my lab's hoping to do in the future is understand how this plasticity can happen and why things like eating fish oil diets could, could help reverse it. I wanna end just by uh, giving you a taste of some of the other things that are hopefully coming up in the lab. Um, so PSO2 is a very important player uh, in mechanosensation. But for a lot of reasons, we know it can't be the only thing that's contributing. It opens and closes very fast, and these neurons can fire for hours. Um, so there have to be other pieces to this puzzle that allow these neurons to keep firing as you maintain stretch. And so um, one of the projects that we're very excited about is to look at another class of ion channels, the voltage-gated sodium channels, which are found in these neurons. We're doing that in collaboration with Dr. Theanne Griffiths Lab at Davis and her grad student, Cyrus Spino, and Serena Ortiz, who started on this project as an undergrad and is now a grad student in my lab, um, has shown that knocking out two of the three voltage-gated sodium channels that are in, are in your body uh, cause severe impairments in how these stretch uh, sensitive neurons function. So uh, we're hoping to continue this work to figure out what that means for the, um, the mice or humans that have mutations in these channels. There are quite a few genetic diseases that target these voltage-gated channels. 
And most people only look in the brain for most things because you've got a lot of these channels in the brain. So people with these disorders have epilepsy. They also have movement disorders, which everyone thought was because of problems in the brain regions that control movement. And we've shown it's actually peripheral. So um, that could suggest some ways that you can target to improve the movement deficits in those patients. So that's one um, that we're working on. And uh, the second one kind of came as an outcropping of that. I didn't have time to tell you that my lab has shown that this neurotransmitter glutamate seems to be involved in stretch sensitivity. So we wanna know what receptor it's acting on. And Jeff Swanson from Northwestern, who is actually Theanne's PhD advisor, uh, went to one of her talks and she was showing how the, the mice with this um, bulge-gated sodium channel knocked out moved. And he said, hey, those look exactly like some mice I have that have a mutation that's involved in another rare genetic disorder to a glutamate channel. And so uh, we've just started this project, but we're trying to figure out if in fact um, in those, uh, if in fact that receptor is involved and then disorders that target that receptor, they lead to motor and proprioceptive deficits, again, because of peripheral effects and not just effects on the brain. So the lab has what I think are a lot of exciting new directions to uh, keep figuring out, again, the function of these neurons, how they work, the molecular machinery, and then um, trying to translate that into potential relevance for human health. And with that, I'd like to end and open it up for questions. Again, acknowledging the wonderful team of students in my lab. I highlighted just a few. Um, I've been very lucky to have a lot of great collaborators. And I've talked about the work we've done with Ardem and his lab, especially Shang and Sung Hoon, uh, Thean and Cyrus and uh, Jeff Swanson. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge my funding, including NIH, CSU and SJSU grants as well as grants from NIH, NSF, Department of Education, SJSU, and CSU for supporting students in my lab. And with that, I'll take any questions you might have. And am I supposed to, or I guess I can look here at the Q&A. All right, I've got a question in the chat I can read if no one in the room wants to go. All right, um, so thank you, Marcel, for this one. Two questions, can you explain in practical terms how you actually knock out a channel? Great question. Um, so every protein in your body, including channels, are uh, encoded by a DNA sequence called a gene. And so in the mouse and in other model organisms, um, we, can, we can take out that sequence. And there are a variety of ways to do it. In my research, um, people have knocked in sites on either side of the gene that these um, that a molecular enzyme, it's kind of molecular scissors, can come and cut out. And so if you express the molecular scissors in just one specific type of tissue, like the sensory neurons, it'll cut out that gene just in that tissue. But so to get rid of proteins, uh, at least how we did it, you cut out the gene sequence so it can't make the protein. And the second ones. Ah, what sorts of things do you do to ensure the care and well-being of your research mice? Thank you very much for that question. Um, so uh, one of the big things that we're always asked is about um, uh, what the pain and distress levels are. And so all the mice that I showed you here um, don't necessarily have uh, higher pain and distress levels normally, um, with the exception of the animals that had trouble walking around. So we would make sure that there was food and water on the cage floor so they could easily access it. Um, any procedure that requires pain in these studies, we would give them anesthesia so that they didn't feel it at that time. Um, anyone in the room? Yes. Thank you. Is it possible to briefly explain how someone can walk with sight, but they lack the piezo too? Ah, okay. Very good question. So how can people walk with sight when they lack piezo too? So um, they can, uh, so for instance, Ian Waterman that I showed you, um, he, he thinks about contracting his muscles and he has to look, and instead of getting the feedback from the muscles that his, his leg is gone where he thinks it is, he has to use his sight to see it and say, okay, I, I overshot it. I need to correct by um, contracting more. It's actually very, very difficult to do that um, if you have absolutely no sensory feedback. So it took him years to learn how to do that. And now in, in people, 
that have um, like those piezo two knockout patients that I showed. Um, I didn't show you a video. They they can walk a little bit better when they have the site because they've learned how to integrate like that as well. So they can see where they're putting their feet, uh, contract and kind of uh, reshape their body based on that. But if you if you have your sense taken away um, kind of acutely, you know, you've, you've grown up, you haven't had to think about it. It's very hard to learn to do that. Um, but even just normal proprioception or balance, you, you kind of use visual cues to know that, hey, I'm going off balance uh, or not. Um, some students in my class a couple of years ago, they did an interesting experiment where they asked people to close their eyes and try to stand on one foot versus open. And you do a better job when your eyes are open because you're also you also see some of that sway. Um, it just feeds into the motor control areas of your brain. So, so proprioception um, in people with all of their sensory systems in play will take sensory feedback from your sight, uh, vestibular system touch, and the muscle proprioceptors and feed that together to come up with a motor plan to, um, to walk or keep your balance. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, all right, thank you, Emily. When proprioceptive skill is honed by extensive practice like ballet or the ladder rung test in mice, is that a local change at the muscle spindle or via cortical processes upstream of the muscle itself? That is an excellent question. Um, so learning skills, like, you know, if you're a basketball player, getting better at that. Um, I think mo uh, majority of that is probably in cortical levels and, and um, getting better at that. At the actual muscle spindle itself, there's a little bit of evidence that you can actually train it thanks to the gamma motor neuron feedback, um, but that's pretty new and a little, I don't think, uh, controversial is not the right word, but it's not totally proven how you can do that exactly. So I think most of it's happening um, cognitively, but you can tune the sensitivity of your muscle spindle and you can, um, and it looks like perhaps you have a little bit more control, independent control of your gamma motor neurons that might lead to some learning at the level of the muscle spindle itself, which is an exciting new direction that uh, I don't know all the answer to. All right. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Um, are there other proteins or channels that are known to disrupt proprioception, uh, including to piezo voltage gated sodiums and glutamate receptors? Wondering how common genetic proprioceptive disorders are in the human population. That is a very good question that I don't have the answer to. I suspect that it's more common than we think, but since in human genetic diseases, um, it'll be a whole body knockout. And so most of the time people will look in the brain first. Um, so I think some of these things are getting incorrectly um, kind of ascertained to the brain. Uh, there might be more than than we know. Um, off the top of my, I would. Off the top of my head, I can't think of any other ones than those, though. But thank you for the question. Um, Bree, thank you for the question. Do piezo levels or activity decrease during aging? Uh, that is a good question that I do not know the answer to. Although there's more and more evidence coming out that um, the lipid composition of the membrane really matters to piezo two mechano sensation. And so, like I said, in those piezo two gain of function animals, mm -hmm. um, they can um, uh, they can reverse some of those effects by giving them lipids um, that make the membrane less stiff. So then that um, goes in the reverse direction of overactive to less active. And actually uh, you can also do dietary um, uh, dietary supplementation to help reverse an a lower active piezo two channel, which happens in a mouse model of Engelman syndrome. So to go back to Jeff's question, um, I think that there are some genetic diseases that target other proteins and Engelman syndrome. It's I think a ubiquitin, something that gets rid of proteins, um, but it, it also has a knock-on effect of altering piezo two activity. Um, so there might be some more genetic diseases like that that indirectly get at piezo two. Um, anyone in the room? No, okay, I've got um, 
Do you see different impact on your proprioceptive readouts if you knock out piezo two from birth versus no knocking out after maturation? That is an excellent question um, that I am really hoping that the grant reviewers that reviewed my grant on Monday agree with you is an important question and give me money to look at. So far, we've only knocked out piezo, or uh, we've only looked at piezo two being knocked out from birth. But what I want to do is knock it out later and see if it's still as severe or you can have compensation. Because like I said, I'm really interested in understanding how plasticity can occur in these neurons if you modulate increase or decrease activity of the molecular machinery that's important. So that's a great question. Um, Pam, thank you for your question. Nice to hear from you. Uh, for your students, at what stage do you involve them in research? If they're a freshman, how do you teach them to work in the lab? Those are great questions. Um, I have uh, included students since they were freshmen in the lab. Uh, in fact, the guy in the red outfit there, uh, started in my lab as a freshman, as did Sarah, who I highlighted. Um, so I include students from all levels and teaching them to work in the lab. We do a lot of peer training in my lab. So more senior students teach the newer students and as newer students get comfortable with some of the techniques, then they teach the next crop. Um, uh, Janine, nice to hear from you too. Are there clinical examples of patients who have gain of function mutations in piezo two that correlate with their physical abilities, like elite athletes, gymnasts, et cetera? Good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, the only gain of function mutation that I know of is the one that causes, uh, there are actually a, a couple different mutations that both cause gain of function mutations that give you that DA type five. So the only mutations I know of are bad, um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't more subtle ones that we just haven't seen. So yeah, I've got a lot of, I don't know, but those are great questions. Uh, will there be applications of this research to help patients with Parkinson's disease? Um, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, I don't know that I've seen anything that the muscle spindle is impacted by Parkinson's necessarily. I, I think people are thinking it's mostly a, um, uh, in the, in the brain, the dysfunction in the brain. Um, but that's a good question. I can't think of anything right now. Um, can you talk about proprioception and connection with equilibroception and how to improve the latter? Good question. So proprioception is definitely needed to uh, help you maintain balance. You can train proprioception. I'm not as familiar with exactly how you do that, um, but I think that that is one area that people are trying to understand how to do better, like uh, train yourself to pay more attention to the sensory cues. And if there are problems with uh, whatever sensor, either the muscle spindle or, or some of the other um, sensors that involve that you adapt to rely more heavily on other things like sight, for instance, um, and so I think that there are some like physical therapy um, type interventions that they're trying to do that. And I think that that's a pretty big area of research that I unfortunately don't know as much about. Yes. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Is there a difference between the effect on the somatosensory system and the motor reflex like system at the spinal column? Uh, sorry, can you, is yeah. there a, like a difference between the effect on the somatosensory system and then the motor reflex system, like the feedback loop? Uh, so um, the, the sensory arm of the motor reflex is part of the somatosensory system in general. Um, I guess when you're talking about somatosensory, are you talking touch or? Yeah, touch. Um, yeah, so. So the muscle stretch reflex, that's all, that's all in your muscles. So that can be impaired and your touch can be fine. A lot of times it goes in, in parallel though. Does that answer your question or? Okay. If, if you want to rephrase, I'm happy to, no. to try again. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any other questions right now? I do have to say that what I was thinking is um, you've explained the body movements of every zombie and every zombie movement ever now. <laughs> I think actually now I can finally figure out why they can't figure out where they are in space and because it's always a virus, right, that creates the zombies. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. I'm happy to help. <laughs> um, with that, let me uh, get everyone to thank um, Dr. Wilkinson again for an outstanding talk, amazing work, and thank you so much for just engaging all our students and your colleagues and all this research. It's just really wonderful. So thank you. Thank you very much.
We'll see you all later at home. Bye bye. Thank you everyone for uh, tuning in. Thank you.